based on last year's numbers of all this kind of stuff that we just allocated out that we're going to put into factory overhead. And I want to point out also that note that the factory overhead before this had nothing in it. And that's just to point out that we could do this allocation. That's why we base it on last year's numbers and that's why it's an estimate because we want to be able to allocate it out before maybe there's even stuff in the factory overhead because it's going to even out at the end of the time period and we'll have to make an adjustment for it. So, so that's why we have to make the estimate kind of based on last year's numbers. We actually have negative factory overhead. We allocated stuff out before we recorded the factory overhead in this case. And so now we have a negative factory overhead, kind of like negative inventory. We're going to put the stuff in the factory overhead uh, in the next few journal entries. And then we will end up with something close, hopefully, to zero. It should go in the factory overhead and then out of factory overhead. Or in this case, out of factory overhead and then in the factory overhead. But so it should even out by the end of the time period. And so we're putting it in there. And then the other side is going in here in the work in process. So we're putting it in the work in process. Here's work in process. What's in work in process now? Remember, this was direct labor. This, I mean, this was direct material. This was direct labor. This is factory overhead. And we're going to have to then allocate that, of course, to the job because we hit the work in process. We need to back this number out by job. Here's how we're going to back it up over here. Now, uh, how are we calculating this? We're saying direct labor. So in this case, direct labor total was this 218 we did last time. 218 times 0.5. That's how we're coming up with the 109 total. If we want to break it out by job, then we're just going to say, okay, here's the direct labor, the 30,000 times 0.5. That's our 15 for job 14. And then we're doing the same thing here, the 120 times 0.5. That's the 60,000 here. And then the 68,000 here, 68,000 times 0.5. That's the 34,000. Now remember, these numbers don't have anything to do with labor, but we used labor in order to see how big each of these jobs are relative to each other. So you notice that this one had labor of 120, the rationale being that we should allocate more to this job based on the fact that direct labor is higher because that would indicate that it's a bigger job. Therefore, uh, we allocated uh, more overhead, 60 to here compared to 15, which had much less direct labor. These two aren't directly related. This direct labor indicates the size of the job and therefore the allocation method for the factory overhead. All right, so next time, indirect labor paid and assigned to the factory. All right, indirect labor. So we're going to debit factory overhead. We're going to credit cash. These are going to be the types of things that we're going to have to put into factory overhead, which we already allocated out uh, b before. So the factory overhead, what? Indirect labor, once again, we're going to think about payroll here. This is payroll happening. Uh, we're not thinking about payroll taxes. We're debiting, instead of payroll expense again, we're debiting factory overhead because it's going into the asset. Last time we debited factory overhead for payroll for the direct labor. And the difference here is that we don't know which job these guys worked on specifically. It might be the supervisors or something that kind of supervised all the jobs. Or maybe we don't know what they did really, but we need to apply it to the job somehow. So therefore, we're going to put it in the factory overhead and then allocate it out using that allocation method we did last time. So we already allocated it out, see, and now we're putting it in this 14,000 into factory overhead. No effect in this case on the job cost because when we put it in the factory overhead, we haven't yet applied it to the job. We haven't put it in the work in process. That's the whole point of us putting it in the factory overhead. I don't know which job to put it into. Therefore, we couldn't put it in the work in process. We're going to allocate it out as best we can using some kind of ratio. All right. And of course, the total here still ties out to the total there and the total there. And next thing that happens, amounts uh, applied to factory overhead. So here's all the other stuff that can kind of be in factory overhead. We got the, the indirect materials. We've got the factory utilities, the factory rent, the depreciation. These are all things that on the factory, anyth anytime something says on the factory, that means it's going into inventory. That's part of the inventory process. And either we can apply it directly to the job, which means we put it in the working process, or we can't in this case. Therefore, it's going into factory overhead. So the journal entries related to this then would be materials. We're going to debit factory overhead, the 14,000. Uh, I'm sorry, factory overhead for the 30,000. That's this item here because we did the 14 last time. And then we're going to credit uh, raw materials inventory. It's coming out of the raw materials up here.
and we can also see that right there. All right, and so these are going to be things that we couldn't apply direct, like glue or something like that, types of material we couldn't apply directly to the job. Then we got utilities, so we're going to debit the factory overhead for the 12. Here it is there, and we're going to credit cash. This is another one that if you think of utilities, you probably think utilities expense. And so what are you doing debiting uh, the factory overhead? Because it's utilities on the factory, and therefore it's part of the inventory, and we have to capitalize it. So it is in accordance with the accrual matching principle, but you may have just memorized that utilities should be debiting the utilities expense. So you got to unlearn that. And then uh, next we have the rent, 20000 to factory overhead. Here's the 20000 We're going to credit cash again for paying the rent. And this is another one. You probably think rent expense, right? That Why are we debiting factory? And again, same thing. Well, it's rent on the factory where we make inventory. Therefore, we have to put it into the cost of the inventory. And then we have the depreciation on the equipment, uh, 30000 debit. Here it is in the factory overhead. And credit accumulated depreciation. Once again, you're probably thinking, uh, how do we record depreciation expense since the beginning of time? Debit depreciation expense, credit accumulated. Well, this we're not having an expense. We're putting it into the factory overhead because it's depreciation on the factory. So remember, we already allocated out of the factory this 109. This is all the stuff that we allocated here. And so the 109 minus all the debits means that we're off. Our allocation was out of balance by the 3,000. That's okay. That's an estimate. We're going to have to deal with that, though, at the end here. All right, so now we transfer jobs from work in process to finished goods. So now we have work in process here, the 260. We're, gonna, we're done with some of that stuff. So we're going to take it out of there and put it into the finished goods. So here's our job cost. So we, jo we transferred 14 and 15. So here's 14, here's 15. We're going to say it's not open anymore. It's now closed. It's now closed. So if we take out the calculator here, we're going to say that the two jobs that we have are this 186,000 plus the 314,000. Those got allocated out 500,000. Those are allocated out. What's left, just the yellow account of 260, 260, that's what's going to be left in work in process. This and this are going to be allocated out to the 500. How do we do that with a journal entry? We're going to debit the finished goods, 500,000, putting it into 500, and we're going to take it out of work in process. If we look at the general ledger account, what's happening, it's going into finished goods, debit finished goods, 500,000, that's where this number came from. Crediting work in process was at 760,000 minus the 500 credit brings it to 260. There's the 260. These need to be backed up by the job cost report as they are here. All right, so we're still tied out there. And next item, now we're going to sell. So now we've got stuff in finished goods, and we're going to sell it, meaning it's going to move to cost of goods sold. Now, the confusing thing when we sell something, we sold job 14, and they give us a sales price. When we think about a job cost system, the sales price can actually throw us off because we haven't been thinking about the sales price at all. We've been thinking about the cost the whole way through. This sales price has nothing to do with our job cost report. We may have gotten to the sales price by using the job cost report, but the book is usually going to give us a sales price, and we're going to record the same journal entry we would if it was just a service company, or at least the first half of it's going to be the same, meaning we're going to debit, uh, in this case, the cash, 380, and we're going to credit sales. So that's just we got 380,000 cash. We're going to credit sales. Now, where did we come up with the 380? The book's going to have to give it. We did some kind of markup. We don't. We, they didn't tell us that, right? We came up with the sales price. What we do know, though, is job 14 was sold. Here's job 14. It's no longer closed. It's shipped. It's gone. It's out. And it had a cost of the 186. So what's going to happen? This finished goods, we're going to have to give it up, crediting the 186. And we're going to have to put it into the cost of goods sold. So we're going to debit cost of goods sold, the expense related to the asset that we sold. And we're going to credit the finished goods, taking it out of finished goods. So in terms of our asset accounts, the finished goods is going to go from the 500 down by the 186 to the 314. So here's the 314 there. Here's the 314 here. And of course, and here's going to be the 314 here, represented by the job that has been closed, but has not yet been shipped out. It's going to be in the finished goods. So if we recap this, then we can see that the 260,000, 260,000 will be in the job cost. That represents the job that's still open, the job that we're representing 
with the yellow item. It's going to be still open, still in the job cost. That's backing up the work and process account. Now the job cost system is also going to have jobs that have completed and have gone through the process. So we have this job 15 that has closed but has not yet been shipped. Shipped. That's going to be the 314. That's what's going to be in the finished goods here. That's in the finished goods and that's in the finished goods on the trial balance. And then of course we have the job that has been shipped out. So this job has been completed, been shipped out. We've represented that by highlighting the shipped area. That's going to be the 186,000. And that's going to be what the cost of goods sold is representing at this point because it has been shipped out and therefore expensed. All right, so then we have the last piece. We got the adjust for underappreciated or overappreciated factory overhead. So what are we talking about here? If we look at the factory overhead, remember last time we, had, we left off with this 3,000 credit in factory overhead. We applied out 109,000 to our jobs. And then we put all of this stuff that makes up the factory overhead and our estimate was off by the 3,000. We need to make that go to zero because we want to uh, basically have a zero at the end of this time period so that we can make a new estimate next time period. So we just need to make that zero. So how do we make it zero? That's a credit. Therefore, we're gonna do the opposite thing to it and debit it, making it go down. Where are we gonna put the other side? Easiest thing to do, put it into cost of goods sold, crediting cost of goods sold. Now you might be saying, well, that's kind of funny because cost of goods sold is a debit balance and it's an expensive count. Why would we be crediting it? We don't normally credit cost of goods sold. And the reason is because uh, it's a small amount. Hopefully it's in material. We're doing this because the estimate was off. It's going to be off because it's an estimate. And we need to, to take it down somewhere. If it's in material, then taking it to cost of goods sold is the easiest thing to do because cost of goods sold is something uh, that will then close out to retained earnings. Unlike some of the permanent accounts, all the permanent accounts, which would not close out, Therefore, once it closes out to retained earnings, it'll be gone, and that'll allow us to basically make a new estimate next time uh, from scratch, from fresh start. So that's going to be the idea. Now, if it was significant, if it's a large amount, then we may have to do something else. But if it's insignificant, meaning it's not going to affect our decision making, then it would seem appropriate to just put it to cost to get sold, sold that being uh, the easiest thing to do. Also, just note that if, if we happen to have gone the other way, meaning that we ended up with a debit of like 3,000, we would do the same thing. We would make it go to zero. We're gonna do whatever we need to do to make it go to zero. And in this case, it would be that would be a credit to make it go to zero. And then we would debit cost of goods sold, once again, doing whatever we need to do to make it go to zero, as long as it's an immaterial amount. No effect on the job cost system of this. We still have the 260 tying out to the 260 because the factory overhead, we're just dealing with the factory overhead, not the work in process, not the finished goods at that point.